Ina alhamdulillah, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. Welcome to another session of Sunnah Followers Tawheed class. And for this class, we have been focusing in on what it means to believe in Allah and to believe in Him and His oneness. And as part of being a Muslim, we all have to declare our testimony of faith. And declaring the testimony of faith entails declaring that there is no God but Allah. But how many of us truly live up to that? How many of us even understand the implications that come with that statement? As you guys are finding out, very few of us really do. You know, we say that we believe in Allah and his oneness, yet we associate partners with him all the time. We associate partners with him when it comes to our love. We associate partners with him even when it comes to our fear. So this is something that we need to work on as Muslims, and that is strengthening and bettering our connection with Allah, assuring that our belief in him is as it should be, that we are not engaging in any actions that can fall into the category of association, because this is the one sin that Allah will not forgive. He may forgive any other sin, but he will not forgive you if you die upon association of partners with him. And yesterday we spoke about how uh, a lot of Muslims today commit sins and they don't fulfill their obligations. And when you approach them with this, They'll say, oh, well, it's okay. You know, my parents were good Muslims. My mother was a good Muslim. My father was a good Muslim. And they'll be able to intercede on behalf of me. They'll be able to intercede for me. And, 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 and inshallah, that, that will bring about uh, good for me. Well, we have to understand that no one, we talked yesterday about, yesterday about how no one can intercede on behalf of you unless Allah allows it. And if you were a person who lived your life disobeying Allah, deliberately, intentionally disobeying him, what makes you think that Allah is going to allow anyone to intercede on your behalf? Well, this is what we discussed yesterday. And I do have a couple of questions here from yesterday's lecture to see if everyone here understands the, uh, what we discussed. Uh, let me put this quiz up here on the screen. And this is taken from a verse of the Quran. Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, and warn those who fear that they will be gathered before their Lord, when there will neither be a protector nor an intercessor for them besides him. Warn them so that they may fear Allah and keep their duty to him. This is what those Muslims who have that conception need to understand. This verse here, Warn those who fear that they will be gathered before their Lord when there will neither be a protector nor an intercessor for them besides him so that they may fear Allah and keep their duty. Who can tell us what is Allah saying in this verse? Who can break down what Allah is saying to us in this verse? Go ahead. Who can break down what Allah is saying to us in that verse? There's 20 Muslims in a Zoom room. 
six on Facebook. Out of 26 Muslims, I'm sure one Muslim can offer up an answer. Alhamdulillah. It's just simple English. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Alhamdulillah. Okay. And Nisa always, I lost always yeah, tries I to save on somebody and then always I tries to save y'all. Y'all need to stop letting the older women try to fight y'all's battles. I'm going to hit it this time. Now I'm going to hit it right on the head for him. Yeah, go ahead. And Allah says, and warn there with those who fear. Those who fear are people like us who are here at this website. We fear Allah. We fear the day that we know we're going to be before our Lord. And when we get before our Lord, we want to make certain that we have no protector, that we've never had any intercessors, no shirk, none of that having anything between ourselves and Allah. Because for us, for us, because we fear Allah, we're keeping our duty toward him. May Allah be merciful upon us and grant to us paradise. Exactly. Good job, Anissa. Basically, it's just what she said. Allah is letting us know in this verse, unless you were a person that did live your life in this world, fearing Allah, obeying him, keeping your duty to him means obeying him, as Anissa said, doing the things that Allah commanded you to do. Unless you lived your life that way, fearing his punishment, fearing his anger. He's not going to have an, uh, anyone to intercede for you. And you will have no one to protect you. It's all about the consequences of the choices we made in this world. Good job, Anissa. So this verse of the Quran is the evidence or the dalil. When you come upon Muslims who say, oh, I don't have to pray, or I don't have to do this, or I know I'm a bad Muslim, but you know, the good thing is my mother was a good Muslim and she's gonna pray for me and get me out of hell. Let them know, uh-uh. Only if you kept your duty to Allah, the fact that you're not praying, that you're not fasting, the fact that you are not obeying him. Why would Allah allow anyone to intercede for you? Good job, Sister Anissa. So since Akina said the law is saying there will be no intercessors or protectors, so we should fear law and keep our duties to him. Yes, unless he allows it. Exactly. Good job. A law is saying unless you live your life in this world fearing his punishment, and retribution and fulfilling the obligations he imposed upon you, there will be no intercessors. And we have to understand that, guys. You know, so many Muslims today uh, take Allah for granted. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it would be this way. This is one of the signs of the last hour. You know, Islam will become strange. The Sunnah will become abandoned. Okay, people will uh, uh, take advantage of Allah and his favors. They take advantage of his blessings. You know, and they'll deviate further and further away from the straight path, okay? And we're quick to say, oh, well, you know, the good people that came before us, our good relatives, our good forefathers, they'll make the difference for us. They'll be able to intercede for us and plea on our behalf. It doesn't work that way. No one will be allowed to intercede for you unless Allah allows it. And he tells us he's not going to allow intercession. If you were a person that didn't fear his punishment and if you didn't fulfill your obligations to him. Okay, good job. Let's look at question number two. This is another hadith that a lot of Muslims don't understand the meaning of. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked, Oh Prophet, who will be the happiest of the people to receive your intercession? And the prophet answered and said, 
Anyone who says, Allah sincerely and with pure intention from his heart. We hear this hadith being mentioned all the time, but what does it mean? How many of us truly understand the implications of this hadith? Well, does it mean which of the following? Does it mean A, anyone who dies following the religion of Islam will receive the Prophet's intercession? Or does it mean B, anyone who dies with the intentions of and hoping for forgiveness will receive the prophet's intercession? Or does it mean C, only those who live their lives true to the meaning will receive his intercession? Which answer is correct? C. Who is that that spoke? Awa. What you say, Awa? I say C. Okay, Awa said C. Anybody else? C. Medina said C too. Sakina said C. Anybody said A or B? A. I say A. Who is A? It's uh, Sophia. Okay. And anyone else says B? Nobody says B? Okay. Let's look at each answer. Let's start with B since nobody said it. The prophet said, whoever says, la ilaha illallah, sincerely and with pure intentions from his heart. Does that mean that anyone who died with the intentions and hoping for forgiveness will receive the prophet's intercession? Why is it that this answer is incorrect? This answer is wrong, by the way. Can anybody tell us why? Because they didn't take the shahada. Not really. Anybody because, else? Because they didn't live it the way it was. And we were instructed to live it. Exactly. It's all about living Islam. The Christians, they don't, don't, it doesn't every Christian have the intentions of being forgiven for their sins. Yeah. Do you guys know any Christian out there or any Jew out there who doesn't hope to be forgiven for their sins? Well, they're not going to be forgiven. Why? Because even though they said they believed in Allah, did they really believe in Allah? No. no. The prophet said you have to have sincere, sincere belief in your heart. When the prophet says sincere, pure intention, that means sincere belief. You have to, that's why we have to be careful with these hadiths. If I were to retranslate this hadith from the Fusha Arabic into English, I would take out the word intention and replace it with belief. A lot of these hadiths were not translated well in English. They lose their meaning. And like you guys heard Dr. Asim say, I play stupid a lot. I speak Arabic. I just don't like it. But y'all know the people that know me know Layla understands that Fusha. She just don't want to talk it. I don't, because I don't like language. Okay? I like the hadiths. But anyway, yeah, you have to, you know, anyone who has sincere belief in Allah in his heart, sincere belief in their heart, okay? The Jews and Christians claim to believe in Allah, but they don't. They don't obey him. They violate the Ten Commandments every day. They go out and get drunk and then think that they can go to church tomorrow and be forgiven. They think Jesus died for their sins. They also associate partners with Allah. The Jews think Israel, you know, was the son of God. So again, having uh, the, the, the intentions and hoping for forgiveness ain't enough. You have to live Islam. And that's the point that that, uh, that one sister, for those of you who are in the Zoom room, that woman, that Arabic sister that joined that uh, room that with me and Dr. Asim, that's what she was saying. The one who couldn't speak English well, but that's what she was saying in Arabic. And I understood her well. She was saying that she said she don't care about what people say. There's a lot of people that talk about Islam. There's a lot of people that say they believe in Allah. But like she said, if she looks at your actions, it's about acting upon what you preach, practicing what you preach. That's why I kind of like that idea because I'll be able to bring more Arabic people into here. Be, these are people who grew up in a Muslim land and truly understand, you know, 
what this stuff is because they see all the fitna they see all the lies they see the deceit they see the hypocrites they see the people pretend to be holier than now when they're the biggest hypocrites so that's why i kind of like that idea pfizer make sure you get it together you know we're gonna try this because i think we need to bring more uh muslims who have been who have been living islam who are not just converts but they come from the beginning of this because they can see how that you can hear their experience as to how Islam has deteriorated in the in those Muslim lands. Islam has deteriorated in Saudi Arabia. It's deteriorated in Egypt. It's deteriorated in all those Arabic lands. And that's what she was saying. And she was saying it in Arabic, but I understood her well. She was saying it ain't about what people can speak about Islam. I want to see how you live it, how you're practicing it. And that's why that other sister said that she liked my point. She was Arabic too, the one from Egypt. She was saying, I totally, totally agree with what Sister Layla is saying because, you know, Islam is a way of life. How many of us live this way of life? And for those of us Muslims who grew up in Muslim lands, who come from that, we know that these people are not practicing Islam correctly. You know, so I think that's a good idea to open this uh, my uh, website up to more Arabic people like myself who can share their experiences with how they see Islam deteriorating terribly, which is why Allah is going to send the Gog and the Magog. Okay, so again, guys, you know, the, the, the Muslims are no many Muslims today are no different than the Christians and Jews. They have all the hope of forgiveness and all the love for the prophet, but they have no fear. Remember guys, Allah says you will never be a true believer until you number one, have love for Allah. Number two, fear his punishment. If you're gonna sit here and say that you don't fast and you don't pray because you know you don't think you have to, you know, or because, or even to say that you don't fast or pray knowing that you should, but you don't, you're too lazy because you think your mama because her rewards is going to be enough for you, you know, subhanallah Allah. You don't have the fear of Allah. So Allah is not going to allow the Prophet Muhammad to intercede for you. He is not going to intercede for you. And then let's look at number A. Most of you said C. Look at number A. The Prophet said, whoever says, la ilaha illallah, sincerely and with pure intentions from the heart. Does this mean anyone who dies following the religion of Islam will receive the prophet's intercession? For those of you who disagree with this answer, why did you disagree? Sister Faiza, did you disagree with the, with this answer, Sister Faiza? Um so with A, I think the word following the religion of Islam uh anyone who dies following. I mean anyone can say that they follow a religion but it's all about living your life um so i i also said see it's about living your life um the true with the true meaning of la ilaha illallah exactly so all of you who said a you are wrong that answer is wrong too just like allah says in the quran just because you say you believe in allah that's not enough. And Sister Faiza, you heard those two sisters too, didn't you? Couldn't you understand a bit of their Arabic too? I think you understand some Arabic like me too, right? On and off, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what they were happens. saying. That's why, you know, and Faiza's Arabic too. She's Somali, but she's also Arabic. She's like me, half breed, half breed. She's half Somali and half Arabic. Layla's half Viking and half Arabic. My Viking got Bantu mixed in it too, though. But anyway, she could understand what they were saying too. You know, a lot of people say it, and that's what Allah says. Just because you say you believe in Allah, that's not enough. The Christians say they believe. The Jews say they believe, but look at them. There's a lot of Muslims that say they believe. Look at Musaylama. Who was Musaylama? My cousin Mukhtar spoke about him with y'all. Musaylama was one of the biggest liars of all times. He lived during the time of the prophet. He converted to Islam. He claimed to be a prophet too, by the way. He took bits and pieces of Islam and changed it. 
Instead of praying five times a day, he said, we're going to pray three times a day. Instead of fasting the whole month of Ramadan, we're just going to do a week, a week out of Ramadan. You know, but he claimed to believe in Allah. You know, believing in Allah, saying it with your tongue is not enough. Just because a person took shahada, and a lot of Muslims don't understand that. They read this hadith, and they give that same answer. They think that when the prophet said, whoever says, la ilaha illallah, will, uh, with, well, uh, with pure intention from his heart, I will intercede, and they'll be removed from hell. That's not what it means. That it means whoever truly believed in Allah. Just because you convert to Islam, there's going to be a lot of Muslims in hell. Do y'all know that? Most of the Muslims you know, including yourself, might be in hell. The prophet said out of every 100 people you know, 99 of them are going to bust hell wide open and, be, and stay there. The prophet said, one of the signs of the last hour, you will search throughout the entire world and only find a handful of true believers. A handful of true believers. Just a handful, that's it. So taking the shahada is not going to save you. If you did not declare and truly believe in what it means and live it like Pfizer said, implement it like those two women were saying on that program, live it. Then Allah doesn't accept from you. You're not a Muslim. You're just a Kafir in disguise. There's a lot of Kafirs in disguise amongst us. Sad to say, but it's true. Okay, so the correct answer is C. All of you, and it seems like everybody said C except one person, but everybody else said C on Facebook and here too. The correct answer is when the prophet said, whoever says la ilaha illallah sincerely with pure intention from his heart, what this means is only those who live their lives true to the meaning of la ilaha illallah will receive his intercession. Does every Muslim here listen to me understand? And I really wish that I really see the good of that program Dr. Assam was telling me, because if I had them other two Arabic women in here, they could probably really break it down because they seen a lot of, um, they see a lot of uh, fitna in Egypt. Well, both of them were from Egypt, but um, there's a lot of fitna in all the other Arabic lands too, especially Abu Dhabi and Kuwait and all those places. People say we are, everybody in those countries say la ilaha illallah. Everybody living that's born in them countries that say la ilaha illallah. But look at what they're doing. Are you living la ilaha illallah? And that's why people are so discouraged. Like those women were saying, did y'all hear what Dr. Asim was saying? He translated for y'all. I couldn't hear in here, but y'all said y'all could hear. He was translating. There's a lot of atheists. In the Muslim Arabic lands, a lot of Muslims have become atheists. It's so bad in our practice. There's a lot of Muslims who have, have denied Allah and just say that they don't believe in no God at all because they don't see the deen being practiced as it should be. And that's why Dr. Asim wants me to go there and bring the doubt. I see why he wants me now. He's a scholar. Dr. Asim's a scholar too. He probably did it with the coaxing of Sheikh, Sheikh Morsi, too. Well, the other two, all three of them. So anyway, so exactly, guys, that's the thing. You know, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, people in the Muslim lands are becoming atheists because they see the hypocrisy. They see Islam not being practiced. Even Brother Ahmad, Brother Ahmad lives in Pakistan. He said, even here where he lives, it's the same thing. Many, this is a Muslim country. Pakistan is a Muslim country. And many of the young people are becoming atheists because they've lost hope, because they don't see Islam being practiced as it should. They hear it. They hear people speaking about how we should live and how we, we should do this, but they don't see it. And not just in Pakistan, not just in the Arabic lands, but even in Malaysia. 
There's a lot of people. I got a brother here now on Facebook saying the same in uh, Malaysia. You know, so again, you know, we people are becoming atheists. Even though they declare la 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 la, how many of them truly live it? You'd be surprised how many la 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 people are atheists. And that's what those two sisters uh, from Egypt were saying in Arabic. Now, and I think Dr. Asim did translate to y'all. Okay, so the correct answer is C. And I want y'all to not forget that. That hadith means only those who truly lived this line will receive the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's intercession. If you did live and practice Islam correctly, you ain't got nothing coming. That goes for you innovators too. The Muslim, the, um, Allah says, verily you, Muhammad, guide not whom you like, but Allah guides whom he wills. He knows best those who are guided. Who can give us the meaning of that hadith? Zulayla, are you recording on Zoom? Because it only says it's live on Facebook. It don't matter. Zoom, that recording is, is for this quiz is gone. That's why I say I'm about to take it off of Facebook. Okay. Because I can't restart. I mean, it, I lost it when my computer crashed. Okay, so what's the meaning of this hadith, guys? What's the meaning when Allah, I mean, this uh, verse of the Quran, when Allah says, verily you, Muhammad, guide not whom you like, but Allah guides whom he wills and he knows best those who are guided. What does that mean? Um, this hadith was in response of when the Prophet وسلم, was asking his uncle Abu Talib to convert to Islam, but Abu Talib refused to um, convert to Islam up until his death. And that's when Allah like sent this revelation and told the Prophet وسلم, that you alone don't have the power to guide people to Islam. Your only job is to like convey the message. And I'm the one who um, allows people to convert to Islam or like opens their heart to Islam. Exactly. Basically, only Allah makes Muslims. Only Allah makes Muslims, guys. You know, we can want all we want to. You can speak about Islam to people as much as you want. Unless Allah uh, uh, decrees for them to convert to Islam, it's not going to happen. And uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was our example. And he lived that. He was taught that by Allah. You know, he loved Abu Talib and wanted him to convert. And uh, Allah let him know, you know, you can sit there and beg and plead all you want to. Unless I turn his heart, he's not going to turn. So Allah makes Muslims. And that's something that we all need to learn uh, as dayas, those of us who call ourselves messengers and callers to the truth. We have to understand as a messenger or a caller, you know, you can convey the message all you want to. You can call to Islam all you want to. You can convey the truth all you want to, but unless Allah has decreed for that person to be Muslim, it's not going to happen. He makes Muslims, not you or me. And this is something important because believe it or not, guys, there are a lot of Muslims out there who believe that it's our job to go around and convert. You got some Muslims out there who will tell you that they were taught that they have to convert at least one person a week to Islam. How many of you have heard that? And I don't know where they get this from because nowhere does Allah say that we have to go around forcing Islam on anyone because there's no compulsion in our religion, number one. And Allah is the one that makes Muslims number two. Okay, so good job. Um, any questions about any of these answers? Any questions about any of these answers? Okay, no questions. You guys did pretty good on this quiz here. Uh, let me put the um, PowerPoint up on the screen for today because we're going to continue to speak about uh, how so many people declare, so many of us declare la ilaha illallah. Mohammed or Rasulullah, but we invalidate it so much, so much in how we live our lives. Let's put the PowerPoint up here for review. And I hope that my internet does better now. Today, we're going to speak about being excessive, being excessive in the religion. And we're living in the days of fitna. 
the days in, of fitnan in which the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said you will live to see much excessiveness much excessiveness in the religion i want you guys to understand that excessiveness is a bad thing allah hates a fanatic just as much as he hates a person who is negligent islam is a way of life based on balance and as muslims we have to balance ourselves in our practice listen to what allah says and the interpretation of the meaning all people of the book and whenever allah speaks about the people of the book he's addressing the jews and christians he said do not exceed the limits in your religion nor say things about allah unless it's the truth and when allah sent this verse down ibn abbas tells us what the prophet said because also uh in another verse Allah says in the interpretation of meaning, and they have said, you shall not leave your gods, nor shall you leave Wad or Sua or Yaguth or Yauth or Nasir. These were idols they used to worship. And uh, Ibn Abbas explained these two verses. He said, these are, those names are the names of the righteous people from Noah's time. When they died, Shaitan came to them and convinced the people to make statues in their honor. And then when the people would go and honor those statues in, he, he convinced them to give the statues names and to worship them. Okay, and this is how shirk uh, began. It began with the people of, of Noah. And that's, this is why as Muslims, we don't hang up pictures of ourselves or of our children or of animals, of any being with a soul. We don't put pictures of beings with the soul on display because the human is weak. We're human. And remember, we all have a gen assigned to us. The job of that gen is to try to seduce us, to seduce us to disobey a law. And that gen hoovers around in your heart. He knows that when you're, somebody dies, you look at that picture, it's gonna make you feel sad. So he'll whisper to you and try to get you, you know, to not let go of your memories so you can fall into shirk. So this is why we don't put pictures of our loved ones out on display. If you want to take pictures, you know, keep them on your phone or put them in a book and put them in a drawer somewhere. But as far as hanging up, up on the wall, we don't do that. The same with pictures of animals. Do you know how many people worship horses, worship cows? worship cats because they're beautiful creatures some people wish they could be a lion wish they could be a tiger so they worship him they put pictures on their walls and say i am that lion watch me roar and all of that so again you know allah knows his creation and this is why as muslims we don't put pictures and stuff on display that's how the first shirk began with the people of noah Okay, so again, guys, uh, uh, this is an example of exceeding the limits in your religion. The Jews and the Christians exceeded the limits in their religions by building statues, statues of the Virgin Mary, statues of, of Jesus, okay, statues of Isra, okay, then they begin worshiping these statues, talking to these statues and all of that okay also ibn al Qa'im uh said that most of the companions said after the death of those righteous people uh that's when uh uh shaitan you know and in, uh incited the people to go and make statues over those graves and they started worshiping them and umar tells us that the prophet sallallahu and i want everybody here I want everybody here who thinks it's okay to celebrate birthdays. I gave y'all one clear evidence the other day. And I'm giving you another clear evidence. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, do not exaggerate in praising me as the Christians exaggerated in praising Jesus, the son of Mary. 
He said, I am just a servant of Allah. So call me his servant and his messenger. That's what Rasulullah means. Rasulullah is an Arabic word that means messenger of Allah. We have messengers today. I am a messenger. Dr. Assam is a messenger. Sheikh Morsi is a messenger. Jamali is a messenger. But we are not Rasulullahs. We are not messengers of Allah. We are just messengers of the people. Okay, learn English. If you guys learn English, you will stop all that birthday. Whenever you celebrate a birthday, what are you doing? You're praising that person. You think that that person, because he or she was born, that they are to be praised for that. They didn't create themselves. That's exaggeration and praise. The Christians celebrate the birthday of Jesus. They exaggerate their praise of him. The prophet said, don't do that to me. But you guys are doing it every day to your children, with your children and your grandchildren and yourselves. Shame on you Muslims. Y'all better get it together and stop all that birthday crap for real. How can you justify celebrating the birth of a human being? Like that human being did something to be born. Like that human being is worth, worthy of the praise. He's just a human being <clears throat> that'll probably end up in hell <clears throat> like most of us. And that's what the prophet was saying. Don't do that to me. <clears throat> Don't do what the Christians did. But again, we Muslims are doing it. We imitating the Christians and in everything, including birthdays. Also, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this, and I want you Muslims who celebrate birthdays to ponder this. This is another dalil. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, beware of exaggeration. Your predecessors perished because of their exaggerations. Do you know what exaggeration mean? Do you know what predecessor mean? Nope, you probably don't because it's larger than four letters. Beware of praising and glorifying others. This is what destroyed the people who came before you. Because to praise and glorify others, this is to become extreme. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, destroyed are those who are extreme in the religion. How many of you are extreme? Extreme in this religion. If you're celebrating birthdays, you're extreme. By the way, let me make a comment on this because I forgot I said I was going to talk about this today because look on Facebook. I can't believe it. Not only do we have Muslims celebrating birthdays, we got Muslims doing Halloween trick or treat. Y'all see it? Look how many masjids across America and not just America, but even in the Middle East, because my sister sent me some stuff and I, we was laughing about, are celebrating Halloween even in Abu Dhabi. Trick or treat, a Muslim country. Look how many masjids are holding movie night. Come to the mosque tonight. Dress up like a character. Dress up like an anime character. Come to the mosque tonight. We're going to serve popcorn. We're going to have um, pop. We're going to watch a lot of nice movies. We're going to watch the Avengers. Dress up like however you want and come to the mosque tonight. I'm not surprised because they celebrating birthdays too. If you're that stupid to exaggerate and celebrate the birth of a human being, then you are stupid enough to celebrate shaitan. Hello? Halloween is definitely the day of shaitan. 
and you know he's just enjoying this. Why you Muslims gather your children at the mosque tonight to watch movies dressed up as anime characters. Shame on you. Signs of the last hour. Signs of the last hour. So again, we can see the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us to beware of exaggeration because this in religion, because this is what destroyed the Christians. This is what destroyed them, the Jews. They both used to be the chosen people, but Allah cursed them and destroyed them because of how they exaggerated and went to the extremes in the religion, introducing things into this religion that's not a part of it, like birthday celebrations. And now we got trick or treat Halloween, okay? So thus we learn a lot from these hadiths and these verses of the Quran. We learn first of all that the first uh, 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 the first so association of partners with Allah happened due to the confusion regarding righteous people who died. They allowed the people allowed Shaitan to come in and convince them to worship them. We also learn that innovation to introduce something into this religion that is not a part of it leads to disbelief. We also know that anytime we take away from this religion something that Allah put in it or introduce something in regards to worship that Allah did not allow, this is innovation. And again, the prophet enforced over and over again to not exaggerate in praising any human being, not him or anyone else because this is what led to the curse of the Christians. But again, we Muslims are doing it. So again, guys, I want you guys to ponder these hadiths. I want you guys to ponder these verses of the Quran. And then I want you guys to ask yourself, are you true believers? You sitting around celebrating uh, uh, Halloween tonight with your kids? You sitting around celebrating birthdays of anybody. You over praising and glorifying any human being on this earth that way. You think any human being is worthy of being celebrated. You got some problems. And again, we can't say that we didn't know because Allah says he has sent messengers to every nation of people. I am a messenger. I am a warner. I'm not a Rasulullah, but I am a messenger for the people, a messenger of the truth. So don't say you don't know, because I'm not the only one. There's millions of messengers on this planet right now. That's the problem. It's too many of them. How many of them are giving you the right message? That's the question. Are they conveying the right message to you? Or are they uh, 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 conveying some scripted crap? But the bottom line is when you in that grave, you won't be able to sit there and say, oh, Allah, I didn't know because nobody told me. Remember, the prophet said when you enter into that grave, the angels will ask you, did Allah not send messengers to you? And you sit there and say, no, nope. well, what was Layla? What was uh, Mufti Mink? What was Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Adli? What was uh, uh, Abaz Yuni? What was Khalid Yassin? They were all messengers. So how dare you lay in this grave talking about, no, Allah didn't send you a messenger. You just chose to reject it because you loved your desires. You loved your, your, your weaknesses more than you did a law. Think about that, guys. When we say that we believe la ilaha illallah, do we really? Okay, you love your children so much that you're going to put on a Halloween party at the mosque today and call it just an anime dress up? I have never heard something so ridiculous before. Well, yes, I have. I've heard a lot of stuff that's ridiculous. That just falls right into the rest. Think about it. 
All right, so we'll stop right here for today. Supana kala huma wa biham dika, a shadow on laila haila enta, sakpi ruka wa tubui lake. If there's any questions or comments, inshallah, you can go ahead and type them on the screen. And by the way, for this recording, since my internet went out, I'll just take it all off of Facebook. Thank God it's still live on Facebook. I can edit it and put it together.